Okay, we're live. Uh, hey guys, Drew here, thatanxietyguy.com. We're back for another episode with my good friend Holly coming all the way to us from Mallorca, not South Africa. <laughs> Can you get the mopeds again. going by? Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> maybe, maybe. maybe. <laughs> uh, so for those of you that did not see our first little installment in this, we are taking uh, hope and help for your nerves, which is like the gold standard in all panic disorder and I think anxiety disorder books or beginner books anyway by Dr. Claire Weeks. Uh, and we are going to go through the book chapter by chapter, Holly and I together. Um, and we hope that you're going to grab a copy of the book or an audio copy, or whatever it happens to be, and follow along with us. So, Holly, this week we're going to talk about chapter two. And all the chapters in the book are really short. This one is super short. Super short, like, yeah. Literally like <laughs> five-minute read tops. And the chapter two is called How Our Nervous System Works, and Dr. Weeks goes through um, the basics of how our nervous system makes us feel the way we feel when we are having experiencing anxiety and panic. Uh, so she talks about the fight or flight response and how that all works and what's voluntary and what's involuntary. So I guess let's go through it. I think this is um, Holly and I were talking before we went on the air here, uh, and we were talking about how while this is a really simple and short topic to cover, um, and Holly, jump in any time. I think it's super critical because this is the foundation upon which so much is built. Uh, so yeah. many people get stuck on the physical part of panic disorder, panic attacks, anxiety disorders. And it's really not about the physical part. But in order to get past that, you have to understand physically what is going on, get a grasp on it and understand that it's natural and not dangerous. Yeah, so, it can feel like such a sort of mysterious thing that's going on to you. But actually, when you can sort of unravel that mystery in this chapter kind of thing, isn't it? It sort of explains everything why you're feeling like you're feeling right, and it's not actually feel. that mysterious no it's not mysterious and it's not dangerous so wh no. wh when you f start to feel these these things and we'll go through it um for a few minutes but when you start to experience anxiety and or even panic and you start to get out of control that way your heart is racing you're sweating you're feeling hot or cold your legs are getting rubbery we all know the symptoms because we all experience them uh, they're just natural processes that are happening in your body uh, it's the way your body has evolved over a few million years to actually work if you need to be saved. The problem is these things are happening at an inappropriate time. So it's a completely natural response to a perceived danger. And you really have to get to the point where you can understand and perceive those sensations as natural and expected and predictable and measurable and not at all indicative of any real danger. So the symptoms are just misplaced, really, is what's going on here. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So Should she talks about the flight, fright, or freeze. Do you want to get started that way, I think? Or? Yeah, yeah, the flight, fright, freeze. To be honest, in the book, the book was written a very long time ago. And so if you're just reading the book, it, it is almost a little bit hard to get your head around about what she's talking about. Um, and so I think these days we actually understand sort of the physio physiology of um, what's going on in, in the sort of adrenaline flight or fright or freeze um, sort of stage. So... It, I'm, I'm straying just slightly from what she's written here, and I think we should just explain the sort of the modern day understanding of flight, fright. That's freeze. probably a good. Flight, fright. I can't <laughs> say it. <laughs> the book is probably. I think the book is more than fifty years old now. It was written in the sixties, yeah. I believe. Yeah, the nineteen sixties. So at least that. Yeah. It's at least yeah. fifty years old, and it's not that our human physiology has changed, but there's so much, especially with the internet now. You yeah. can Google for days and days and days and learn about these things. And, and um, so she takes a very cursory overview of it. But I think what she does is sufficient to understand, um, you know, what's going on and to, and to learn not to be afraid of it, I think. So that, that's what we're yeah. going for here. Yeah. Um, so the flight or fight, that's it, flight or fight or yes. freeze, is, the, is a sort of physi physical state that our body gets into if it um, thinks that we're in danger, if our you know, brain has perceived that there's danger and we need to run away or fight it off or like play dead and just freeze. Like, you know, animal, if you see animals in the sort of headlights and stuff, that's, you know, that's what they do. That's the sort of natural thing. And um, so that's, and that's governed by basically like, <laughs> it's governed by a part of our subconscious brain that, just sends out a sort of um, hormone. Is it a hormone? Adrenaline? Yeah, yeah it ultimately it's hormone. hormones. Yep, it is. Uh, yeah. So our, our, the nervous system is sending our, well, they're involuntary nerves, like you said, sort of a subconscious, or they call them involuntary nerves for a reason, right? We can't control them. Yeah. And this part of our nervous system will send signals to our endocrine system, things like adrenal glands, pituitary glands, to secrete hormones into our bloodstream that changes the way our body works. 
Yeah. So it's all triggered by the brain because our nervous system will send signals to glands that secrete hormones that change the way we're functioning, elevate our heart rate or that sort of stuff. Yeah, and so some of the things that that adrenaline does when we get that rush is that it speeds our heart up because so that we can like run faster mm -hmm. or like, you know, use our muscles and stuff. It um, will t um, takes away the blood supply from anything that's not super important, like your stomach. You don't need to be digesting your food whilst you're running away for your life. So it's, it diverts the blood away from that and basically puts it towards all your muscles, which is one of the reasons why you shake, because there's so much like energy in your muscles to be used That's if you right. go for a sprint when you're having a panic attack you'll go really fast but yeah <laughs> yeah yeah uh, so that's true so blood flow is being changed in different places so once and i think the key thing here is to understand that it is and in the in the chapter she talks about voluntary versus involuntary nerves yeah. uh, and she uses the term nerves it's such a dated you know like it's a very yeah, dated thing a very like, you have to take it for based on the time that she wrote the book but um, voluntary versus involuntary nerves and trying to understand that this is involuntary. So the way this gets triggered when we perceive some sort of danger. So the way I usually like to talk about it, if somebody quickly, you know, pulled a loaded gun and pointed it directly at you, that's the danger. And these signals would be sent by your, out of your involuntary nervous system. There's danger. We need to get into fight or flight mode to save ourselves. The signals get sent. We can't stop them from happening once they happen you know, the adrenal glands are going to work, the pituitary gland is going to work, and these things are going to happen to your body. So once yeah. that flash happens, your heart rate is up, you're breathing heavily, you're sweating, you're shaking, your, your pupils dilate, so your vision gets kind of wonky. And these are all the things that we would expect to happen. They're predictable and measurable and natural. It's exactly what your body has evolved to do. And we're basically reacting to a perceived danger or a threat. It's just that in our case, uh, people like us, there's no actual danger. It's, it's, it's misplaced. But I think the important thing to remember is what Holly said. It is involuntary. Um, you can't stop it. And I think yeah. once it happens, you have to learn what it is, understand what it all feels like, and and really begin to, to believe that it's not dangerous. It's not this how you feel is not going to kill you. It's a symptom of what you've perceived. It's yeah. not the actual problem, how you feel one about of, the problem. One of the best things I read on this is that if it's like the analogy of if you're just a normal person and someone jumps out of a wardrobe and goes boo at you, you know, yeah. and you're really not expecting it. You go like, whoa, and you know, you feel that sort of whoosh of just like, oh my God. And then when you realize it's not actually like someone, it's just like your sister jumping out on you or something, you go like, oh, okay. And then it takes maybe like a minute for you to sort of like feel normal again. Right. That's sort of like how every panic attack starts with that whoosh. Um, but what the difference is in people that suffer like we do is that instead of going whoosh, oh, no way, it's just, it's not actual real danger. It doesn't, get, so it would go away. We go whoosh, oh my God, it's a panic attack. This is dangerous yes. because we're so scared of panic attacks. And so therefore, this is where the cycle and the pattern of fear comes in. And because we get that whoosh and we go, oh my God, I'm having a panic attack then you go then the brain goes oh my god i heard you say oh my god it's a panic attack that must mean you're really in danger i'll send more then i'll keep sending more and so it send more and more adrenaline so it doesn't stop because if it was just that initial whoosh of somebody jumping out of the wardrobe at you you would then realize it's not actually dangerous and it would start to very quickly go away like the adrenaline would sort of leave your body quite quickly although true. so you've still got no control over it first happening you still got like oh my god you know like mm -hmm. and you feel all those sort of weird symptoms but it's so fleeting that's actually all that's really happening in a panic attack it's exactly the same response it's just that it's prolonged because you're still thinking it's dangerous and i think that that's a function of the interpretation so um, interesting. And I have to just throw this out there. Well, I won't throw it out there. I'll throw it at the end. But I was speaking mm -hmm. to a friend of mine um, a couple of weeks ago, and she said, she said to me, because she knows that I deal with anxiety and panic at times, she said, it was odd. I, I, suddenly I found out of the blue, and this person doesn't have a history of panic attacks or anything like that. She said her heart was really racing, just started racing on her. And obviously she was kind of, she was obviously anxious or a little bothered by something, and she had a bit of a physical reaction to it. But the way she described it was perfect. Her heart started racing, and she said, well, something must be up. I'm, I'm nervous about something. And she just sat there in her car and waited for it to stop. And guess what? It did. 
So <laughs> it, it went away because she doesn't interpret that sensation. She interpreted that sensation as being indicative of something bothering her. She's yeah. feeling anxious about something. So, okay, my heart's racing. And she just waited for it to go away. And sure enough, within a minute or two, it does go away because adrenaline is self-limiting. It doesn't go on forever. And we could talk about that maybe in another episode, but yeah. um, it's the interpretation. So when we feel that, our heart is racing, we're having a hard time breathing, our vision gets weird, we're shaking and all this stuff. The, as it, we should really interpret that as, well, this is my body telling me that I think I'm in danger. But instead, we interpret the symptoms as the danger. So the exactly. feelings become the danger and they are not. And that's when your cycle kicks in. Oh, my God, my heart is racing. So I'm in trouble. I'm in danger when you're yeah. really not. And that could be for a variety. I think people have different sort of fear responses as well. So they might fear that like they might just fear the panic attack and go like, oh, my God, I don't want to have a panic attack. This is awful. And so they re perceive that as a danger. Right. They might think, oh, my God, it's not a panic attack. I'm actually having a heart attack this time. And so yes. they think that's a danger or they are tricked by the sort of anxious thoughts that come along with, you know, the panic attack a lot of the time where it just tricks you into thinking like, no, you're definitely in danger this time. This time. Right. Never mind the 99 million times this has happened to you before. This is the one <laughs> that you should really be worried about, you know. And, and that's and because we sort of fall for that, you know, like it just perpetuates it and it's that pattern of yeah it's just a pattern of fear that's true and i think just trying and again i keep beating a dead horse here a little bit but understanding <laughs> that these things are involuntary so that perception of fear is going to kick off that cycle you can't stop it once it's happened it's happened and i i see so many people who spend a tremendous amount of time trying to stop the physical sensations from happening yeah. but once you have that flash of panic and you get into that mode there's no way you're just going to have to ride it out and it will stop pretty quickly. So even in the worst panic attack I can probably have these days, I can be assured that it's over within about 10 minutes tops. Yeah. Um, you know, you're tired afterwards and you're still feeling shaky and whatnot, but it's going to go away if you don't interpret the way your body feels as being the danger itself. Or you don't interpret it as, well, this time it must really be a heart attack or a stroke, mm -hmm. even though it hasn't been the other 10,000 times. <laughs> so it's really a cognitive thing. And that's why I've said in the past, uh, panic attacks are physiological, but panic disorder is cognitive. There's two different things. Here. Yeah. Yeah, and absolutely. So. I think it's important that people realize that although it's involuntary and you can't stop it, you can stop the prolonged bit of it by right. jumping in. You've got to be your own sort of like wait a minute. <laughs> yes, that's exactly <laughs> this right. Isn't, you know, and so this that's isn't where dangerous. you have to start learning. You know, if you understand it's involuntary, this is just natural. My body is doing, oh, here we go again. It's doing it again, you know, inappropriately or at the wrong time. If you can relax into it, it will self-limit and begin to go away. And then when you learn that, it then the sensations, I think, I don't know if you'll agree with this, but for me, now that I have learned how to do that, um, if my I do feel my heart race, or for me, dizziness is a big symptom. You know, that's one of my yeah, big symptoms. Too, you know, I can get a little bit dizzy and it doesn't completely freak me out. I don't interpret that as anything, but eh, here it goes again. And sure yeah. enough, you know, I, I'll just ignore it and go about my business and relax. And sure enough, it goes away in a couple of minutes. So um, I, I think that's super important and it doesn't feel as intense anymore. So even though my yeah. heart might be doing 110 beats per minute during a panic attack and it's it used to do that the same 110 beats, 110 doesn't feel nearly as pounding as it used to. Like for some no, reason, absolutely. The, right, the sensations don't feel as strong as they used to feel. So Yeah, I always think of it when I feel those sort of symptoms come on, I just think of it as the someone jumping out the wardrobe at me. I'm just like, oh, oh, OK, it's just that whoosh, you know, I right. can deal with that <laughs> the, the initial flash the initial flash exactly yeah so we, i think again for chapter two we can't control it uh, this is not something that we can learn to control you can't stop it and when we start to talk about the way you address these things in future chapters it's really important to keep this part in mind that it's involuntary it's going to run its course when it's going to run its course you can't make it you can make it last less by not adding more fear, like you were saying, by, by breaking yeah. the fear cycle. Uh, but you can't stop it necessarily from happening once it's, it's started. So I think as we talk about future chapters and what Dr. Reek says we're supposed to do, the whole floating and letting time pass thing, um, those things are not designed to stop this dead in its tracks. There's, no. there, there's nothing that will instantaneously stop the sensations. It doesn't exist. And I think that's why some people struggle with the idea of that they think that the cure is to be 
completely panic free because it isn't because you can't ever stop that initial thing. If you're stressed out, you know, I still get it. Now. Like if I'm stressed, I'll get symptoms of, you know, that anxiety and panic come on. And then I go, like, oh, it's because I'm stressed. Like, of course, because this is going on or this, you know, and and so I still get it. But it doesn't turn into this big, horrible, long sort of life changing sort of disorder. You know, it's yep. just like. It's like just feeling a bit dizzy or feeling you know, for like a little bit for like a few hours or an hour or yeah. 10 minutes of the day, you know. Um, so like I think some people struggle with the idea that they think that the cure is to be completely panic free. And so that's the answer. But it's not actually it's to not allow that that first whoosh to turn into like a big, long horrible destructive whoosh <laughs> that is exactly correct that is exactly <laughs> like if you, if you hear nothing in this thing just listen to what holly just said um, <laughs> and it's hard because i do see people spend a tremendous amount of time and effort and and money and all kinds of things trying to address the physical sensations i need something yeah. to stop my heart from racing i need something to stop the dizziness i hear magnesium helps i hear this herb helps i hear that herb helps i hear whatever helps and they're just they're really trying to address the symptoms of anxiety as opposed yeah. to you know what really is driving that fear cycle so you're right you have to understand it's involuntary it's just a natural thing this is what your body is meant to do and the way to do this is to break that fear cycle and we'll get into that in you know future chapters i think yeah and right. I th we'll be talking about the physical symptoms in other and i think in a few chapters time she goes through each um physical symptom and describes why it's happening and all yeah. that sort of stuff so just like Again, to unravel the mystery of like, yeah, but why am I feeling like this? And, you know, right, right. it's just nice to break those those symptoms down as well. As, a, as sort of irrelevant as they are, it's just nice to know that it's all still part of just this adrenaline that's in your body and nothing else. You're absolutely right. I agree with that because and the underlying concept behind all of those individual symptoms and we've all been guilty of that we all go through each one what is the heart racing heart what is the breathing what is this what is that we try and play whack-a-mole and knock each one <laughs> down but underneath it is this concept of involuntary versus voluntary operation of your body and if you just understand that you can't control it necessarily you just it's just natural it's not dangerous and then we can go through each symptom as she does and address each yeah. one but each one of those is within the framework of this concept which is it's just a natural way that your body deals with a perceived danger that's all um, and it's actually there to save you. This flight or fight response is to save your life when you actually really need it. When you physically need to do something to save your life, especially yeah. in like the old caveman sort of days, you know, yeah. where it's like there's a bear, I need to run away quick. Yeah, you, you <laughs> then like, you you'd be very grateful for that adrenaline. That's true. And those were the days when you, you didn't you don't need to digest food at the moment. You have to stop mm -hmm. being someone else's food. So I need to get out of here so I'm not someone else's meal. And, exactly. Uh, yeah. So that's really what it's all about it's a very primal part of the human brain it's it's not going away anytime soon um and even me well maybe we should not mention it so much because she doesn't really talk about medication so much in the book um no she does she addresses it in one chapter yeah, but but otherwise not that much but no. i think a lot of time and well i'll just kind of briefly mention it it's it's the hot topic of course it's we don't think we have to get into it but many people spend a lot of time trying different medications and they're all geared toward this so ev almost every bit of medication that we have out there, especially the, the benzos and the tranquilizers and that sort of stuff, is really geared toward knocking down the severity of this, this involuntary fight or flight nervous and endocrine response. That all we're really doing in that case is just beating that down or dampening what your body is naturally supposed to do. So we're just, yeah. in that case, I'll go on a limb here, and I know it's, people don't like to hear it when I say it, but you're really just treating a symptom as opposed to treating what's really causing the problem when you do that. Um, so anyway, and then the, the antidepressants are really, they're more targeting stopping that initial signal from happening. So a benzodiazepine okay. is going to try and knock down that, that sympathetic and nervous response, that involuntary nervous, and an antidepressant is going to try and stop it from happening in the first place. Oh, okay. But yeah, but either way, we're trying to just, we're really just trying to stop the symptoms as opposed to trying to stop the cognitive distortion that fuels yeah. the cycle. So. I have to throw it out there. It's what I do. What can I say? No, absolutely. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's so much. I mean, if you can crack it cognitively, then it's great because if you run out of tablets, it doesn't matter. <laughs> and if yeah. your tablets stop working, like no. it doesn't matter. I agree so, 100%. All yeah. right. So I think, I mean, there, it was a short chapter. I think we've said about all there is to say about involuntary yeah. nervous response. Um, oh, just very briefly, I think parasympathetic. She talks about sympathetic and parasympathetic nerves. Um, and if you read it and you start to Google around, you're going to hear about something called, I'm going to mention this because people get freaked out by a parasympathetic rebound. So 
parasympathetic rebound in the case of panic attacks, it's not truly what it is, but um, after a panic attack, a lot of times, I know I feel like I am just wiped out. Like after, even if I've done a good job with it and I've managed it really well, I do feel very tired. You get that, you kind of swing the other way. Uh, a lot of people do anyway where you feel drained, you feel weak. That's yeah, perfectly of course. normal. Right, there's that parath- parasympathetic shift back to a relaxed state. It o- almost overcompensates a little bit. But when you see the term parasympathetic, there is a thing called parasympathetic rebound that is kind of a dangerous thing, and that has nothing to do with this at all. So okay. I sort of need to throw it out there because when you, people see the word parasympathetic, they're going to Google, they're going to see that, and they're going to freak out a little bit. But uh, that has nothing to do with what's going on when you have a panic attack. Just be aware of that. That's all. Okay. Um, and that's it. I can't really think of much else beyond that. I mean, well, I guess we'll be back for the next chapter as soon as we can. Yeah. You have Euro Cup football to watch. Are we really? Yeah, for I've Wales? got Wales versus Portugal. Come on, Ooh, Wales. Come on, Wales. Wales. I'm to- I'm, I am European football illiterate, but I'll root for Wales too. How's that? <laughs> Yay. <laughs> so, um, They've never right. been. I mean, this is the semi finals. This is huge. It's this huge. Is it's huge. So we, we yeah. need to free up Holly's internet so they can stream that before the game starts. She's going to want to divorce. So I'll just wrap it up by saying, as always, comments are are always welcome and questions um yeah, you know we'll see what happens you can comment right on the youtube page where this video is or if you're watching at that anxiety you can comment there and then twitter at that anxiety guy and facebook also that anxiety guy however way you want to like hurl stuff at me i'll make sure holly gets it too and you know we'll, we'll talk about them as soon as we can i guess and then next week we'll do chapter three what is chapter three i don't even know do you know what the next it's chapter what is, is a nervous breakdown oh what is a nerve yeah that's good and that's very <laughs> dated too the old kinds of the nervous breakdown but it's a good one we'll go through that too yeah. so all right that's it so make sure you follow along with us on twitter and facebook and whatnot so you know when these are coming out and i guess we'll catch up with you guys next time yes great right. right, come later. on wales <laughs> yeah, go wales <laughs> see ya all right, let me-